So every listener that wants to become a millionaire, right, put a thousand dollars in your zero year old baby's right S and P five hundred, a thousand dollars a month, and in twenty years it'll be a million dollars. All right, I mean, don't sue me if it's nine hundred fifty grand, but it could be like closer to one point one million, one point two million. If you're not in equities and you're looking to get into, I'd still dollar cost average over eighteen to twenty months, right? Because we think there could be a correction, and you want to get the benefit of it. Special coverage from the Gould Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida, is brought to you by Contango Or, developing Alaska's next gold mines. Hello and welcome to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy on Twitter, CEO of the Soar Financial Group and the host of this channel. Really looking forward to this conversation. We're in Boca Raton. We're at the Rules Symposium, and I'm really looking forward to having a guest here, first time guest in our podcast studio here on Thank the floor Kai. of the conference. Joel Lippmann, really looking forward to having this conversation with you. First time guest, who's, who's Joel Lippmann? Ah, oh, thank you, sir. I, I run uh, Altimetry. It's a financial newsletter under the MarketWise umbrella. Um, we also run Valence Research, which is an institutional uh, investment research. I started out in 91 as a public accountant. Uh, I went into banking uh, at Credit Suisse, which was a big deal back in the day. Now, now I kind of say it like Credit Suisse. <laughs> like I, I, don't, I don't fully pronounce it. It's, it's UBS. <laughs> it's, it's a Credit Suisse. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm very much seen as anti-Wall Street now. 15 years I've been off the street. Uh, I think Wall Street recommendations are nonsense. I think Wall Street research is terrible. I think CNBC and Bloomberg and all the mainstream financial media, um, the they say mainstream media, mainstream financial media, I think is a big financial industrial complex that does not tell the truth about companies, doesn't tell the truth about earnings, about cash flows, doesn't say what's going on. And that's been our claim to fame. So uh, we cover 32,000 companies globally. That's more than anybody I'm aware of. We have a depth of research that we see for those two to 30,000 that all the 10 big Wall Street firms can't come close to. Uh, and through that, we provide our customers, our subscribers, our clients with uh, individual stock picks, with credit analysis. And because we have such a big birth of analysis, our macro work has you know, really come on strong in the last six, seven, eight years, uh, where we have clients that only get our macro work um, about things like US versus China versus Russia versus the dollar versus BRICS or whatever else you want to talk about that I think would be appealing, I think, to your audience versus the individual stock stuff. Yeah, no, yeah. we'll start with a macro. Like right. I really yeah. want to pick your brain on like, how is the economy doing right now? And you're analyzing 32,000 companies. Mm. Maybe we can break it down later on in the conversation, but how bifurcated is the economy as well right now? Let's start at the top. How mm. well are we doing in general? And then we'll, we'll talk companies as well. So I think we're seeing a K-shaped... Uh, it's much like the K-shaped recovery coming out of the pandemic, all right? Coming out of the pandemic, sector analysis didn't work. Sector rotations didn't work. It really was, are you selling something that people are going to use at home or are you selling something that people are going to use, right, in an office? One of them is going to do very poorly. One's going to do very well, even though they both might be real estate or they both might be retail, right, or whatever else. And so when you start thinking of that, um, that K-shaped recovery, we're now in another K-curve, which is companies – because there is a credit crisis going on, but the credit crisis is sub 250 million market cap companies. Hmm. And so <clears throat> part of the big issue where people are saying there's a recession, what have you. Yes, we think that credit tightening and recessionary issues are occurring in the United States at companies that are 500 million, 250 million and below. But if companies could access the public debt markets, hmm. so billion dollar companies and above, they're having an easy time of it. Um, while interest rates might be higher, actual refinancing, credit default swaps, whatever you want to look at in terms of cost of debt, um, is some of the lowest we've been above the risk-free in, I'll tell you, 30-something years. Uh, and so the, the bifurcation we're saying is that if companies don't need financing and don't need debt and are a billion dollars up in market cap, um, we are seeing it is an economic boom. And if your company's at the 500 million or 250 million and below, it feels, and it is, truly a recession. But when you, that bifurcation, I think, is one of the biggest things that um, we haven't seen mainstream media talk about. Um, and I don't think they realize that, that uh, just how great the larger company, and I say larger, micro cap, small cap, right? Anything no. even 750 million above. The CFOs of the United States deserve a round of applause for how they've managed through a higher interest rate environment. It's not a high interest rate environment. Historically, 5%. Is still a very, 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 very low interest rate. It's just a lot higher than zero, right? And so I think the CFOs have done well, but the regional banks, you know, overly commercial real estate and 
autos and you know loans and whatever, I think they're taking it on the chin. And so that's the big bifurcation we're seeing right now between larger companies and smaller. And that's the issue with the economy is that we're seeing the stock market, the S&P 1500, is doing very, very well when people are saying, but look at all these troubles in the economy. And we're like, well, it's because the stock market doesn't represent the economy. And thinking that it does, and when people say, oh, the economy is doing poorly and there's a recession coming or there was almost a recession, but the stock market's at all time highs. And we're like, yeah, not the same thing. The stock market is not the economy. I want to stay on corporate bonds for a second. Oh, Just, sure. uh, is, is there enough of liquidity to, to satisfy the need for refinance as well? Is there enough? At a billion above, it's pretty amazing. So if you look at spreads between high yield debt, what it costs to float for, for a double B, single B rated company to float debt, it's the cheapest levels above risk-free we've seen since like 2004, 2005, and maybe before that. Unbelievable that these companies that otherwise you'd say look like bankruptcy are in deep trouble. So this is not 2008. The people are saying there's another 2008, 2009, or the people are saying that it's like the 1970s just don't have the data. I'm sorry. They're missing a widespread amount of data that says this is not 2008 again. It may be for smaller firms, 200 million, 100 million below, restaurants, smaller, you know, regional banks or whatever. Yeah, it's it's tough in that area, but not for big companies. Yeah, I was going to follow up. But is, is that across all sectors? Like you, you see the liquidity is no problem or is that really... Or do certain sectors stand out where liquidity is not a problem, where you can easily refinance? Like you mentioned restaurants, commercial banking, like is there, or you know, commercial real estate to a degree, is there sectors that stand out to you? Or it's less it- sector-based and more size. Okay. And so if regardless of sector, other than commercial real estate, look, commercial real estate's going to be in a great depression for another five years, 10 years plus. This is not going to go in five years because it's not just higher interest rates that's causing commercial real estate to be in this horrible bear market. It's the fact that people just aren't Right, going to the office anymore. Companies can't force them to. And it is a sea change in psychographics and how people live and work. So um, when you think about that, I think commercial real estate stuff, but all other sectors, the liquidity in the bond markets has been fantastic. So long as you're talking about public debt markets. If you're talking about, I got to go to a bank, no, then now you're in trouble. Now you're getting hit over the head. And if you got to go to the private placement firms, the private equity firms that have become private debt, they have the money and you'll, you'll avoid bankruptcy, but you're going to be paying 13 to 18% plus for that money, even if you're a good sized $100 million company, right? Um, but if you can access the public debt markets, you can float bonds. It's an unbelievable market. The world is clamoring for fixed income. And, uh, and it, it's, I mean, look at the U.S. Treasury. It's a no brainer. I mean, people say, oh, the U.S. is going bankrupt. Well, then why does every time the U.S. Treasury issue debt, they sell out they sell it every single time for as much as they three need. times oversold. Oh my I goodness, believe. it's amazing! Yeah. And so they're AAA all day long. I know Fitch or whoever says they're AA, but that's just for headlines. That's nonsense. If the U.S. isn't still AAA, nobody is. And the fact is, U.S. is still AAA. Yeah. Where, where does the liquidity come from, though? Let's break that down as well. Like, who, who, who's buying? Who are the investors? Who, who's allocating capital in those uh, fixed income markets? The whole world, every pension fund around the world, every government, every sovereign, China. Now, China, they say, has been, there's been a lot of reports that, oh, China's been selling. They used to have 1.4 trillion in US treasuries, and now they only have 800 billion. Well, part of that is because they need the money because their economy is collapsing. They need the money. So they're not selling treasuries to punish the US. They need the cash. The other thing you're seeing is that they're parking a lot of money through Belgium and other countries that. This is not conspiracy theory. This is actually well-tracked that you can see China is still investing in treasuries, but they're trying to do it more secretly so that everybody doesn't say, oh, look at China doesn't like the U.S. And yet they still want that generous 5% dollar denominated risk-free rate because the RMB is in trouble, the ruble's in trouble, any BRICS currency they're ever going to come up with based on what? A conglomeration, a conflagration of three or four of the worst currencies in the world, the ruble, the renminbi, the what? The, the rupee? And the world's going to say that's going to create a BRICS currency? No, you want dollar-denominated um, bonds coming out of the U.S., whether it's U.S. Treasury or corporate bonds. And that's why we're seeing such incredible liquidity there. Yeah. So nobody's worried seemingly about the economic outlook for the U.S. in general as well. Recession may be. Like, where do you stand on the recession well, debate? Like- lots of people are worried. <laughs> um, but that bifurcation holds. And so if you're dependent on smaller businesses, if you're dependent on anything commercial real estate oriented, if you're dependent on regional banks for your money, it feels like a recession. It probably feels like a depression, right? And that's anybody, that's Main Street US, right? That it's almost like, it's almost like what happened during the pandemic where, yeah, we had widespread bankruptcies and hundreds of mom and pop restaurants from thousands went bankrupt. And yet Domino's Pizza had one of its best years. Stock was up 70%, right? During the pandemic. And so if you think about that, we're seeing that again. We're seeing more and more of the, the companies that can weather the storm, have access to the public debt markets, 
public equity capital, dollar denominated, are having an economic boom kind of a year, right? Which is what we're seeing with the U.S. stock market at this week again, S and P and Nasdaq at all time highs, right? And people are like, well, this is a bubble. No, it's not. Corporate earnings is at all time highs, right? Balance sheets of companies at that size, S&P 1500, are some of the safest we've ever seen. Some of the safest, safest, right? It's below that level that it's such a problem. And so this is why I think people are confused in the news because they hear there's more bankruptcies, you know, in this year than there have been since like 2008, right? There, or even 2020 during the pandemic. We're like, yes, but there's small company bankruptcies. And when I say small, I'm not saying it doesn't affect the economy. It does. But are we talking about buying the stock market or are we talking about the economy? Not the same thing. Where do you stand on the recession debate? Are we going to have a hard landing, soft landing, no landing? Like, what's your forecast? Well, I mean, the definition of recession is two negative quarters, right, of economic growth, economic shrink. Um, I think we're awfully close to that already. Um, my guess is we're going to avoid it because we don't have the large company, larger company, mid-sized company, bankruptcies and defaults that really lead to that in 2008. So, you know, I don't know if I want to call it a soft landing. I, I think I want to keep talking about this bifurcation. If you are a smaller business or you're investing in, you know, $100 million or below in certain sectors, it's going to be a really, really bad year and it's going to be like recession. And if you're the S&P 1500, um, you're going to get the benefit of picking up those assets. Now, have you noticed that uh, in the last four or five months, there have been more divestitures, more divestitures than in like 30 years of history of the first quarter of any year in 30 years, right? You have to go back to like, the SNL crisis, I mean, same as all. You have to go back to like '91, right, to see that many divestitures. So what's happening is these smaller firms, smaller, 100 million, 200 million firms, are forced to sell, right, at fire sale prices. Who's getting the benefit? Look at the acquisitions going on by big companies buying these small bolt-on. Mm -hmm. It's not a 50 billion dollar company buying a 10 billion dollar company, right? It's a 20 billion dollar company buying a whole bunch of 300 million, 100 million, 200 million, 500 bolt-ons. And, uh, and that's why we think the SP 1500, SP 500 is still going to do very well, even if, even if we saw a technical recession, meaning economic shrink, that doesn't mean the stock market's going to fall because of it, because they're not the same thing. I know I've said it three times <laughs> though, but I got to repeat yeah. it over and over because people constantly think if the economy does poorly, the stock market's going to do poorly. I'm like, wait, what is making the economy do poorly? It's all the companies that are not what you buy when you buy the S&P 500, the S&P 1500. And for that reason, um, we're still very bullish about the U.S. stock market. I'm not saying there couldn't be a correction, but we're still bullish long term, two, three, four, five years out, 10 years out uh, in a way that um, I haven't been in a long time. I want to break that down a little bit. Are you, are you index bullish, sector bullish? Like, what does that look like? Like the S&P 500 is being led by the NVIDIAs, the meta, just the metas <laughs> of the world just reached another all-time high. Uh, the S&P is at, what is it, 5,600 points roughly right now, which yeah. is insane. Um, but is it? Like, I don't know. It seems is like it. it. Like if I look at it? the performance, like the performance itself, I think it's going up too fast, in my opinion, too fast, too quickly. The corporate earnings at all-time highs. Balance sheets are the safest we've ever seen. What else do you want? I'm not, I'm not saying that it's, but the, the call is that it's a crazy insane, you said insane. It's, I'm just I said insane, I'm, yeah. word. I'm saying it's not insane. You're getting more growth, dollar denominated. That's an important point because no. the whole world are the investors in the SP 500, right? It's not just US and Americans. So the whole world is saying, look at my country and look what's going on with the stock market in the US. Where am I going to park my money? Where am I going to put it? They want to put it there. It's a very rational, reasonable decision. And they're like, well, it's at 24 times multiples. Well, China's traded at 30 to 40 times multiples for like a decade, yeah. right? So it's like if you're looking to exit China, which everyone should be, Chinese equities, right? Yeah. A disaster than Chinese equities coming. It, worse than anything you've seen, right, coming. Well, then where do you put your money? Well, you put your money in U.S. stocks. And so you'd say, well, is 24 times earnings expensive? I don't know. Is it really that expensive? Now, if you, right. break it, if you break it down, like the, you, I mentioned all the AI names that are leading in AI yes. right now, the top of the charts, right? Like yes. in, NVIDIA and then Meta, uh, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they're all up there. But what does it look like below that? Like if you pick Newmont, they're, they're still barely breaking even for the year. Yeah, for so example. what percent of the S&P 500 is Newmont? I, yeah. And that's the I point. Know, I'm just picking so it's, examples no, I, since we had a resource conference, right? I know, and I'm bringing that up because what I'm trying to say is that when you said, is it index or sector? I'm like, well, isn't the whole index getting the benefit of what a small group of companies, meaning the index is super concentrated already. So whether I talk index or talk AI, tech, you know, whatever you want to talk about in terms yeah. of that space, you're already saying it's a tech focused, AI focused index in the S&P 500. Is that right? Well, you know, if you think about it back in the 1990s, people looked at all these dot coms and look at the dot coms. They said, oh, these dot coms are so on. And then what you realize was, no, every company is a dot com. 
right? That it was a dot-com sector, there was an internet, right? Industry at the time. And then you realize, why is there an internet industry? The entire market should be internet. Well, I think that's the same thing with AI. Right now we say there's AI stocks, but where will the AI really go? Every company has to be an AI company. New One Mining has to be an AI company, right? They better be using AI for determining where they're gonna mine, how they're gonna mine, how they're gonna mine more efficiently, how much to put in, seasonally labor, you yeah. name it. And if they're not an AI company, then who is? I mean, in a bigger way than .com. .com was big for retail, it was big for infrastructure, it was built for everybody needs a website. But you say everybody needs AI, that is a bigger statement than everybody needs a website. And so eventually I think we'll realize that there aren't AI companies, there are AI supporters and services and providers Every company has to be an AI company. And where will that happen faster? You think it's going to happen in China faster than the United States? No chance. In Germany? In Europe? No chance. We're way behind the right? AI. No, it's hey, the even US. Even Korea, like Samsung is way behind uh, yes, AI as it's well. It's terrible. Yeah. So who's going to be the biggest users of AI? Well, it's not Russia because they're sanctioned against. It's not China because they can't get the chips, right? It's going to be the US and the developed market. And when you start thinking about that, that really means it's the US. And so, no, no who's going to benefit from AI? The entire stock market, which means I'm not making a call on buy AI stocks. I'm saying buy the S&P 500 because they will all be AI. Just like in the 90s, there was a dot-com industry. And then you said, no, everybody's a dot-com, right? What company doesn't have a dot-com, doesn't have a website? I think you're going to find every company has AI, every successful company. And the most successful companies in the world are the S&P 500. So why would you, you know, it's an easy bet to make for the next three, five, 10 years is buying SP 500. I appreciate you adding a timeline to that as well. Cause back in 2000, 2001, every company added a .com to the name mm. and then they, they boomed and rallied, right? Now everybody's trying to add an AI to it somehow. Ah. X, XAI, whatever it is. But, like, but the year 2000, much like 2008, there was a massive, massive credit crisis and corporate balance sheets were unbelievably trashed. Not just 9-11 made it worse, but it was terrible no. in 01, 02. We do not have balance sheets that are risky like that. S&P 500, S&P 1500 companies, as I said, have really taken care to manage their credit, manage their debt service, manage what their payout. And so while interest rates have gone up, believe it or not, debt service has fallen. So you're saying, what does that mean? Yes, they're paying more in interest companies, no. but the amount of debt that's due this year, they've dropped by like, I don't know, 50, 60, 70, 80%. It's just refining it out. Yeah. Interesting what you mentioned is like you should just buy the S&P 500 and be, you know, be, be happy because I was reading uh, over the weekend in a newspaper, Morningstar put something out in the, in the first half of the year, only 18.2% of actively managed mutual funds and ETFs that compared themselves to the S&P 500 yes. actually outperformed it. Yes. Right. So stock picking is dead right now. Would, would you agree? Uh, I think... No, hold on. Well, you were, <laughs> you were comparing it mutual funds. I think mutual like, funds actively are a managed dying mutual industry. funds and in, in ETF, actively yes. managed ETFs where they stock pick in the ETFs. I think certainly actively managed mutual funds is a dying industry, right? It's slowly dying because all the 401ks are all levered into it, right? So operationally levered into it. But no, that's a dying industry. Um, I think people are looking at ETFs for passive, truly mm -hmm. passive. And there's some fantastic active managers in there. Fantastic. 18.2%. Active managers, <laughs> but it's a small percentage. And yeah. so if you're truly a passive investor, VOO, SPY, if you're on Schwab, SEHB, nobody pays me for this, by the way, <laughs> right? I'm just making a point of that. But that's where I put my money, my yeah. kids' money, my family's money is SEHB, VOO, and SPY. Now that's purely passive. And then you say, oh, but I like a particular stock. Well, then I'll take a piece of that. I'll sell my <laughs> index. I put that money into whatever the stock is. Could be a gold stock. Could be a gold mining stock, right? And then... I either do well or I do poorly. And when I exit that position, I put it right back in a VOO again yeah. or into the SPY. I don't go from cash to an individual junior mining stock and then back to cash, right? I'm taking from equities, going into more risky but higher reward, hopefully, right? And then putting it back into VOO again. So yes, I, I think the best parking space over the long term. Now that said, if you're not in equities and you're looking to get into, I'd still dollar cost average over 18 to 20 months. Right, because we think there could be a correction and you want to get the benefit of it. I wouldn't be piling in at the all-time high, <laughs> right? But we're likely to see more all-time highs over the next 5, 10, 15 just, years. Just, last question on the S&P 500. Do you have a price target in mind? Nah, I mean, it's, no. it's price target is over 20 years, 12% compounded. Okay, whatever that is, whatever that comes to. Oh, well, that's so. if you put $1,000 away every month in the S&P for 20 years, it'll be a million dollars in 20 years. Perfect. Yeah. Awesome, okay. So every listener that <laughs> wants to become a millionaire Right, put a thousand dollars in your zero-year-old baby's right S and P five hundred, a thousand dollars a month, and in twenty years it'll be a million dollars. I mean, don't assume if it's nine hundred fifty grand, but it could be like closer to one point one million, one point yeah. two million. Yeah. 
I quickly want to talk uh, impact of the Fed. Yes. Uh, the, it seems like when it went out, whenever I open mainstream media, everybody talks about the Fed. It's the main talking point. Yes. What, 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 how much emphasis do you put on the Fed in, in your analysis? We run a cognitive analysis. Uh, this is a cognitive and emotional. So we think about it, forensic accounting, what we do, no. getting the accounting, get to the real cash flows of business is not that different from getting to earnings calls and getting the forensics of the earnings calls. So we do audio based analysis of the tone of the change in the breathiness. Mm -hmm. It's a number of parameters. We're actually f featured on uh, Billions. I mean, not that Billions gave us credit, but it was on Billions uh, season five, episode three. Um, and they're talking about technology and the verbiage was almost word for word out of our marketing material. Anyway, I don't tell a lot of people that, but, <laughs> but uh, it was us. Anyway, so we're running this analysis and we run this on Jerome Powell. And what comes through as clear as day is that he's got two punches he's worried about, right? Punching down, right? Unemployment issues. He wants unemployment to stay low and punching down inflation. And he's just playing those two. And as long as un unemployment stays, frankly, as strong as it has, I'm not saying it hasn't directionally gotten a little worse, but it's still the best on the planet. I mean, where is it better unless you're in, I don't know, right, Saudi Arabia or someplace where you're guaranteed a job as a citizen. No. But aside from that, right, aside from someplace like that, the U.S. unemployment is fantastic. It is. Um, and as long as he has that for now, he can keep punching on inflation, which is why last you know, October, when people said, we're expecting six rate cuts, we were very big on saying, no chance, maybe two, right? And now people are saying two rate cuts, and we're saying, ah, hey, you might even see you know, a touch rising right, rates, because as long as he's got the unemployment thing down, why can't he keep punching on inflation until unemployment starts showing bad issues? And once it does, then he starts punching, you know, and, and saying, "Okay, I got to let go of no. uh, the inflation issue." But it's it's two punches, and we follow both. Um, and on the cognitive analysis that we run, uh, where we actually run this audio forensics on his voice, um, we see him still uh, not confident um, that uh, inflation is getting knocked down as much as he'd hoped. He's not confident at all. I mean, he still shows a lot of emotional stress. Um, and when he talks about unemployment, he's like, okay, I'm concerned about it, but right now it's kind of where it should be. Well, as long as that's the case, rates stay where they are. On the, on the jobs report, I, look, I looked at some of the numbers and it looks like uh, the government jobs are being created left, front, and center. It's like yes. the, almost the biggest portion of uh, jobs added in the last report was government jobs. Yes. All right, so the government is helping him there. Yes. So is he worried about the 4% handle if you take away the government jobs added? Like, what does that look like then? I mean, it's, I'm, uh, I follow John Maynard Keynes, and one of the reasons is um, I follow Keynes because he ran money for 14 years for um, an endowment, and he beat the market for 14 years, right? So unlike every other economist and professor with talking head out there, he actually put his theories to work and was a phenomenal stock market, right, stock picker. So, and John Maynard Keynes says, when you have troubling issues, the government should increase spending, right, in the economy when the private sector is getting hit, and the private sector is definitely getting hit at the 100 million, 200 million market value or revenue value and below, it's getting hit. And so I think it's a good thing that the government is issuing um, uh, job creating bills that uh, are helping that happen. Um, but by and large, when you're still looking at 4%, even if it's the government, does that mean Powell has to say, no, I'm going to start rising, raising interest rates? No, he's saying, so for now, the government can fund those some of those jobs. Um, and as a Keynesian, I think that's the right thing for the government to do. Now, as a Keynesian, I also think that when the market does well and we recover from these issues and commercial real estate gets you know, some kind of foothold back at like stability even, which is not yet, then um, I think they've got to, you know, they've got to do something that's a little bit more interest rate friendly. But honestly, 5% interest rates, if it stays at this level long term, U.S. economy, U.S. stock market can do very, very, very well at 5% interest rates. I mean, yeah. think about it. Risk-free rate is probably two and a half. The true risk-free rate for I want my money back, for someone to part with the money is around two and a half. Add inflation of two and a half, that's 5%. Mm -hmm. Add inflation of three, that's maybe five and a half percent. So this range of rates is still super accommodative. I was going to say, in historical context, we're yes. still the extremely 1300 low. 1,300 years of interest rates, these are still fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic, right? Yeah. Not as good as zero. No. But, you know, people well, should have, they should have jumped on, the Treasury did not jump on Trump. You know, Trump was calling for 30, 50, 100-year bonds at 1% and 2% interest rates above the zero. And the Treasury was like, no, 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 we don't <laughs> want to do it. Man, had the U.S. done that, 
yeah. we would be in a much much better shape with our debt service with u.s debt service than uh they should have done what trump said but the treasury backed off it was too bad we missed a we was a chance we're not going to see the chance again no five percent's here to stay no it sounds like it for, yeah. for now because we, we're not seeing a rate cut in in Ju uh, july we get we're about 23 days like 93 yeah, percent of the market expects I mean, no cut there might so. be a slight cut just to pander to the election maybe yeah. maybe but even that okay big maybe deal early in september but big deal but, yeah so joel like the fed has two mandates unemployment and inflation we, we talked unemployment let's talk inflation um where do you stand on the inflation debate we're at 3.3 3.4 percent on the inflation right now should we, should we get used to three percent or above three percent right now and uh, are we ever going to get back to two i mean part of inflation is from zero percent interest rates and from the you know, U.S. giving away money like crazy during the pandemic, you know, you, you throw that kind of trillions of dollars into an economy without increase in production that goes with it. Of course, that's natural inflationary. You have more dollars than you have stuff, right? Um, wars are naturally inflationary. And the problem is wars because you're spending money to have less stuff because you're destroying things. Of course, that's natural inflationary. And that's something you can't get out of. Once that's done, it's done forever, right? You literally have more money out there with less stuff. Next, the fact that China, the world is becoming less China and less, if not non-Russia, both of those countries contributed massively to lower prices mm. over time. And so that is a structural systematic issue as companies have left Russia, have left China. Um, and as long as Russia continues its war with Ukraine, all the commodities that people depend on, oil is going to be more expensive. Gas is going to be more expensive. Aluminum is more expensive. I don't know if people realize how much the world's aluminum market was dependent on Russia, right? I mean, on Russia. And so when you think of these things, you're saying, so Russia coming off the market with all these sanctions and China, the world being worried about China and all its saber rattling and what it might do, and companies have exited, they're not going to go back in anytime soon. So some of the inflation is absolutely permanent, and there's no way it's going to just like roll back to lower prices down the road. That said, wages have been up in the US, um, and as long as wages can continue to rise along with inflation, you know, the feeling it has is, my goodness, I'm spending more money. But yeah, I am making a little bit more money too. Now, I'm not saying that it's not bad for a lot of poor families or whatever else. It is, and thankfully the Fed's doing what it can to keep inflation down. But some of this is not monetary policy. Some of it is structural change in supply chains around the world that's going to take a while before these supply chains are fully functioning coming out of Vietnam and Indonesia and the Philippines and Malaysia and parts of Eastern Europe, which are difficult right now because of Russia. But had we had these things online and if Russia and Ukraine, at some point, Putin's going to have to give in. All right, we're looking at the end of the Russia Federation. At some point, he's going to have to give in. And at that point, that could bring some prices down of things like oil and gas and aluminum at some point, right? But the uh, exit of much of China's production from the world economy and the willingness of companies and the desire to be less dependent on China is going to lead to permanently higher prices. And there's nothing you can do about that. Inflation is here to stay. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on QTs, quantitative tightening, and uh, the, the Fed taking the foot off the gas a little bit on the tightening side, and to maybe tightening less? Yeah, um, yeah. Th does that improve anything? Like, do, do you see that reflected in the markets at all? Um, <laughs> tightening less, meaning <laughs> if they stay at 5%, uh, I think you know, four and a half to five and a half percent. If they stay in that range, I think the U.S. could do very, very well at those rates because that really is risk-free plus inflation, and it's a reasonable risk-free rate. Honestly, there's a lot of problems when you start having interest rates that are negative real rates, which we saw for, you know, yeah. quite a bit of time. I think five percent, five and a half is a nice place to be, um, and I wouldn't call that necessarily quantitative tightening. I'd actually say getting back to normalization in terms of rates as opposed to tightening. Tightening is 8%, 9%, the Volcker time frame, right? 1970s, you go to 10, 11, 12%, whatever the heck interest rates got to, 13 at one point, I think, you know, if I think back yeah. in, the, in the 70s. So um, that's what I think about as true quantitative tightening. Right now at 5%, this means more like normalization of monetary policy as opposed to tightening per se. Let's get to the conference here and uh, maybe a topic yes, of your uh, presentation tomorrow, I believe it is. Oh, this afternoon. Oh, this afternoon. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the American Dollar Innov Innovation Dynamo. Yes. So, um, so summarize the talk a little bit for us because we're going to put this out after you present. So yeah, we're not sure. giving anything away. Right? Well, I'm happy but, to. Uh, what are the main takeaways? Like, what do you want the audience to walk away with? All right. So, you know, my, my background in my firm is that I'm a CPA, but that's not just CPA for financial statement analysis. It's also for tax accounting. At the end of the day, GDP is a horrible 
horrible tool for understanding corporate, uh, sorry, country power. So if we understand country by country power, which will lead to the dollar, by the way, we have to look at taxes. We have to look at taxation. Governments don't spend GDP. A government can't look at its GDP. <laughs> China can't say, we've got the second, GD second biggest GDP in the world. Let's go spend that. <laughs> That's just a measure of all the transactions, right? Just transactions. Um, governments tax income and governments tax income of companies as well as income of people. And what are the most profitable places in the world? Well, U.S. corporate, so this is an important point, U.S. corporations on a uniform accounting basis, you cannot use GAAP or IFRS, you can't use general accepted accounting principles, you can't use Wall Street numbers, they're all horrible. You've got to take the whole world and put it on one accounting cash flow analysis, which means not even the statement of cash flows, which is a horrible statement, by the way, it doesn't make any sense. You have to be a CPA to understand how the statement of cash flows is not a statement of cash flows. <laughs> anyway, look at the cash flows of every company in the world, right, on a uniform basis, and you find that United States companies make more money than all the rest of the world's companies combined. I mean, I want you to think about that. It's not number one. It's more than the whole planet combined. That includes China. So the idea that China's number two, on what basis? Uh, okay, on GDP, that only means it's big. It doesn't mean it has power because China doesn't have the ability to tax. You cannot tax people if they don't have income. You cannot tax companies if they don't have profits. <laughs> and so the fact is, because U.S. incomes are higher than the rest of the world, not even that, U.S. Dis Americans' disposable income is higher than the rest of the world, and U.S. corporations make more than the rest of the world combined in earnings, that means the U.S. has a tax base of something like $5 trillion this year, 4.8. <laughs> something around that, $4.8 trillion this year, on a lower tax rate than China, on a lower tax rate than Russia, on a lower tax rate than most of Europe. So on a lower tax rate than most of developed Europe and Asia and China and wherever, Russia, the US on a lower tax rate collects more in federal taxes the entire planet combined, right? So when you understand that, you can start saying, so does the US have too much debt? Well, what's the debt service of the US? US debt service is around $860 billion this year. Well, compared to $5 trillion, that's nothing. No other country has such a great tax to right. debt ratio. I mean, this is like thinking when someone's going to loan you money and they say, well, what's your mortgage going to be? The first thing to say is how much income do you have, right? Yeah. The second the creditor will say is, the, the bank will say is, what do you have for assets to collateralize? Hmm. The U.S. is still the biggest, the U.S. government is still the biggest landowner of U.S. land. By far, the U.S. still could privatize Amtrak, the post office, airports, interstate highways, you name the things you could privatize. $50 trillion is an awfully low amount for U.S. government assets, probably close to $100 trillion. So you're looking at a company, think of the U.S. government as a company, that makes $4.8 trillion a year and its debt service is $860 billion. How is that a problem? And then on top of that, they say, but what if there's an issue? The company's sitting on... 50 to 200 trillion dollars in assets, right? Versus 34 trillion in debt. That does not sound like a debt issue. Now, I don't want Congress to hear this because I think those irresponsible, you know, mostly <laughs> attorneys, right, Congress, who don't understand a thing about accounting or finance or whatever, and they're just being told by lobbyists what makes sense. <laughs> they, if they hear this, they'll probably go and spend another $10 trillion. But honestly, at current debt levels, the U.S. is not over-indebted, which is why it's AAA, right? And you don't, you can't look at debt to GDP ratios like some nonsense, you know, academicians have done like uh, this book called This Time It's Different or, you know, whatever else that told the Europe you're all over indebted when in fact they had a calculation wrong in their Excel spreadsheet. Debt to GDP, even if calculated correctly, which it wasn't, by the way, debt to GDP, when calculated correctly, is still a horrible metric. You want to look to debt to taxes and debt to assets. Just like any person, like me or you, the bank would say, I want to look at debt to your, how much money you make after tax, and I'll look at your total assets collateralizing it. When you look at that, the U.S. is three, the U.S. is AAA through and through, right? And so it does not, it's not overly indebted, which means the dollar is not about to suddenly collapse. The world is dollarizing, not de-dollarizing because of it. My goodness, is it obvious, right? You go from country to country, all of China population would probably dollarize if China allowed it. Yeah. Right. Russian companies were dollarizing and would if Russia allowed it. But once Russia says you're not allowed to, Turkey tells its companies you're not allowed to dollarize. Um, this is a G20 company uh, country. China tells everyone you're not allowed to dollarize. So what you have is everyone wanting to dollarize it. If they could, you would see a flood in the dollars like you have no idea. Yeah. So, no, it's government regulation that's creating this lack of dollars of increased dollarization but the world is dollarizing not de-dollarizing that's just silly yeah. talk I, the data is there the data is there i'm not talking about what might happen in 10 years okay maybe something happens but right now no the world's dollarizing
No, interesting. Like because the Dixie is fairly flat as well, and uh, like it's it's trading at 105 or whatever it is. Mm. So it, it is hanging in there. It's fairly strong, mm. right? Um, it's it's an interesting topic because it often bring up Japan uh, as part of the debt to GDP discussion, right? Because yes. Japan is the leader, 250 plus uh, debt to GDP ratio. Yes. What does the Japan's uh, tax to GDP uh, tax to debt ratio look like? Do you know? Amazing that. So part of the issue um, is that, as they say, while well, Japan is rich, the Japanese are not. Right? Mm-hmm. Japanese incomes do not have excess disposable income. Remember, if you just have income and you need it to live, that's mm-hmm. not disposable. You can't tax that. So if someone's making two thousand dollars, you know, a year in China. Less than that, two hundred dollars. Most of China makes less than two hundred dollars a month. I don't know if people huh. realize that. Most of China makes less than two hundred dollars a month. You cannot tax two hundred dollars a month, right? You can only tax disposable income. So Japanese do not have excessive disposable income with which they could increase taxes. Japanese companies are notoriously not economically profitable. Huh. They're not, right? So um, while they're probably more profitable than Chinese companies, there's nowhere near the United States. So J- Japan, while it has the third biggest GDP, has a very low level of disposable income and profits relative to the United States and therefore less taxable and therefore they've got a lot more issues right in terms of debt now the government says we'll back up everyone's debt and so all these companies are treated as double A or single A when in fact if they free floated from a credit standpoint didn't have the government backing it you would have a lot of companies in Japan with high yield if not crossover debt ratings that don't have it right now you're an odd animal. You don't really fit into this conference here. Like, this is more doom and gloom. This is a commodities conference. We all like gold. We want the world to burn, more or less. Yes. Like, I'm, you know, exaggerating, I, yeah, obviously. Yeah, the guns right? and gold crowd. I'm familiar with it. Exactly, yes. right? Yes. Like, what, what sort of, like, what are you trying to tell them here? Is Like, are you trying to, like, sort of um, turn them? Right, like you're trying to just like what do you call it? Like uh, you know what it is. Flip them, it's right? Like flip the thinking. We're, like we're at the Rick Rule Symposium. <laughs> Rick likes to stir trouble, <laughs> and he brings me in to do it. Right, and so every year he brings me in during the pandemic. He's like in the bottom of the pandemic. He's like, come out and speak to my you know my group. And I'm like, it was, obviously it was online then. And I was like, well, you know what I'm going to say? He's going to say what I'm going to say. Buy the S and P, right? And I was screaming buy the S and P in March, April, May, June. I put it in Forbes in June of 2020. <laughs> we put it. We're like. Mike, no one's paying attention anyway, so just tell everybody now. It's like, normally I like to charge for my research, right? And then I'm like, just tell everyone because no one's listening. And maybe some of our subscribers will pay attention if it's in Forbes versus just... Now it's right, a national right, library. Right? Right. <laughs> right. right. Everywhere I could, I was trying to, please buy equities, please buy equities, please buy equities for all the signals that we've been talking about. We're all lining up very positive um, in uh, March, April, May, June, 2020. Um, I think our dollar cost averaging period was three months. Right now, just to put that perspective, yes, I'm bullish on U.S. equities, but it's over 18 months or so. And so I'm not coming out here screaming by the stock market, but uh, I am coming out screaming that over 20 years, U.S. equities will do far better for you than gold will, sorry to say, or at least they'll keep pace and you have some diversification from just buying gold, which I like to refer to, my God, is this going to get you? (laughs) We're going to get trolled on this. I'm going to get trolled on this, right? Is physical Bitcoin, right? So explain that. (laughs) I'm going to I'm going to let you explain that. Well, when you buy let's say you buy Pepsi in 1970 or in 1970 you buy the biggest gold nugget found in Montana, right? This is a special centennial gold nugget, right? Yeah. And you bought Pepsi at the time with the old Pepsi logo. And then over time what happens to Pepsi? Well, they created a billion dollar brand called Doritos. They created a billion dollar brand called Gatorade or bought. They created a billion dollar brand called Quaker Oats. They created another 20 billion dollar brands. They created I don't know if people know this. Pepsi created Taco Bell, Long John Silver's, A and W, um, KFC, and Pizza Hut, and then they sold that off, right? And during that time, they created so much value. You get so much dividends from Pepsi, right? Beat the S and P over this time frame. That gold nugget I just mentioned. What does it look like today? I'm same. Identical, <laughs> right? It doesn't pay dividends, which, by the way, is an important piece. Reinvestment of dividends every year is one of the reasons you do well in the stock market. People look at the S&P and compare it to gold. I'm like, yeah, but the S&P is not what you'd experience because if you reinvest the dividends, the S&P is an ex-dividend index, which means it's a lot <laughs> lower. So people always say, well, gold kind of hung with S&P for those five years. I'm like, yeah, but that's ex-dividend. If you included dividends reinvestment, you would have S&P crushing gold during a lot of those periods that people say gold beat the S&P. So... Um, yeah, I cause trouble. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that gold isn't better than dollar. I think the dollar and any currency is a horrible place to keep your money. <laughs> I would never part my money in a currency, including the dollar. But in terms of the dominant form of transaction globally, it will be dollar denominated for a long period of time. And that's 
Yeah. Part of what I'm talking about, which doesn't mean hold dollars instead of gold. Well, for goodness sake, I of course I'd rather have gold than dollars, but I'd rather hold U.S. equities than gold. Fantastic. Over a long term. Yeah. yeah, interesting commentary. No, I really appreciate it. Joel, you've been definitely a different guest here on the program and really a first-time <laughs> guest as well, so I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I'm going to get we... trolled. I can see it already. It's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be fun, though. It's like, we'll appreciate it. We'll, we appreciate any comment. Guys, like, thank you so much. It's supposed to be constructive. Well, so. I try but, to say I don't have opinions. I have data. <laughs> and so if you're interested... Uh, I was going to say, where can we find more of your work? Uh, it's Altimetry. Um, and if you go to Altimetry Macro, altimetrymacro.com, um, your listeners will get like a special $99 for a year. Um, so altimetrymacro.com, um, and that'll stay open, I don't know, for a week after you, you uh, show this video to everyone. Fantastic. But uh, Kai, it's great to talk with you, man. Yeah, likewise. Really? Appreciate you coming on. Thank and you, really sir. appreciate it to uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in here to Soar Financially from the Rule Symposium on the floor of, uh, what is it, the Boca Raton Resort. Beautiful Boca Raton Resort yeah, in Boca here. Raton, Florida. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't done so, hit that like and subscribe button. Leave a comment. We do want to hear from you. What do you think about Joel's thesis? And uh, he says, like, it's not an opinion. It's based on data. So I'm really curious what you think. We do want to hear from you. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots, lots more here from Boca Raton. Thank you. Thank you.